Good morning, Paul. Good morning, Paul. Thank you for joining us today. Good morning. It's great to be with you. Thank you. Thanks as well. So uh, one of the humanitarian issues that uh, you recently highlighted is about the Rohingya refugees. Uh, could you tell us what's the current condition like for them, uh, where are they come to be living, and how are they surviving all of this despite the massive persecution that they're facing? Yeah, it, I just returned from Cox's Bazaar a few weeks ago, which mm -hmm. is the home of the world's largest um, single refugee camp today. Um, and what you see there is over a million people now living um, in a huge refugee type camp setting. So living in temporary shelters, um, almost entirely dependent on humanitarian aid um, and contained in, in a kind of sealed off camp um, within which there are 35 smaller camps. Um, yeah, so th this, this is five years on um, from over 700,000 um, Rohingya having fled from Myanmar. And the situation in Myanmar um, is, is not really much better. There, the conflict continues. It's very unstable and insecure. There are around 600,000 Rohingya who live in, uh, in, in contained camp-like settings, also very limited and restricted in their movements and their access to basic uh, services that you and I would just uh, expect to have on a daily basis. So. It's really quite uh, uh, a terrible and desperate situation to, to witness. Yeah, uh, we've also heard, um, uh, we've reported on it as well, that uh, fires break out in yeah. uh, Cox's Bazaar. Um, not only are they are they having to live under refugee-like conditions, but in fact those conditions are, are worsened because of the uh, things that do take place in that camp. So. Um, how are, they, how are the, the people that are currently there? And it's, uh, obviously there's overcrowding as well. How are they dealing with all of this? Yeah, well, it, it's, it's, it's actually steadily getting worse. Um, mm. I mean, there was a period where, of course, the camp was incredibly chaotic when people first arrived. It was a desperate situation. And, and there was an outpouring of assistance from uh, the Bangladesh host community, from Bangladesh itself, which was remarkably opened its doors to, uh, to, to allow this population in um, and offer them some form of protection. Mm -hmm. um, but since then, of course, this has gone on and on and on. And the situation in which they live, with a fairly precarious um, housing situation, you know, live with very, very basic materials, very closely confined quarters. And we've recently done a survey to look at the um, water and sanitation situation. And, you know, although we could say that in some respects things have improved, we see the quality of water improving. We also see a real gradual deterioration in the kind of basic services that they need. So 88% of um, those we surveyed, you know, they had inadequate access to sanitation facilities. 76% mm -hmm. of the toilets were now overflowing. 51% didn't have access to continuous water. And we're now starting to see over the last three years of uh, an increase in demand for our health services, gradual deterioration in people's physical health, mm -hmm. um, but, but also very notably a real deterioration in their mental health, as there seems to be no solution, no way forward. And everybody I spoke to, you know, that's the first thing they expressed, is that there's just a sense of hopelessness and desperation, you know, where can I go? What's going to happen next? What about my children? Uh, I want a life for them. Um, you know, what's going to happen next? Yeah, I believe that's uh, every time we have we have a look at that situation. It's always the the bleak outlook as to yeah. when is this going to come to an end, and it just keep there's just keeps getting more and more uh, refugees ending up there as well. Sure. Yeah, and I mean, Paul, there's a lot of hardships to get through logistically, physically, and mentally. But what are the obstacles you have faced in your humanitarian work? I think the, the biggest obstacle for everyone, you know, and I, I spoke to a lot of uh, uh, people in, you know, Bangladeshi authorities, I spoke to uh, members of the UN, I spoke to um, uh, people working in agencies, I spoke to embassy staff, and it's the political impasse that's the biggest obstacle. You know, the Rohingya themselves, the majority, they just want to go home, they want to go home. Uh, and, and clearly, of course, Bangladesh wants, wants them to return as well. Um, but of course, there are not safe conditions for return yet. We work also in Myanmar and, and you know, it's clearly insecure, it's violent, it's unstable. People there don't have mobility, access to education. It's, it's very, very, very difficult. So the idea that anybody could return now, and particularly after what happened, after the, um, 
you know, the, the military campaign that, 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 that led to at least 6,700 people being, you know, men, women, and children being, being killed, according to our own assessment, you know, the conditions are simply not there. So that's the biggest yeah. obstacle, is this political impasse. What can be done at the highest political levels to turn that situation around and create safe conditions and afford some kind of rights and protection to uh, the Rohingya who had their own citizenship revoked you know, almost 40 years ago in, in Myanmar. That's the biggest obstacle. Next to that, then, there are many other challenges. This maintaining a population of a million people in, in sort of temporary camp-like settings. Uh, they don't have a right to work. They have no, no ability to make their own livelihoods. They're almost entirely dependent on assistance. Um, they have no agency of their own. It's insecure, as you said, so insecurity. Uh, they're very, very vulnerable, so they're, they're open to being exploited, um, you know, even within the camp setting. Mm -hmm. uh, and then as we see, uh, funding is now decreasing and the commitment to support this population is slowly going down as international attention is elsewhere in Ukraine, Afghanistan, etc., other big emergencies. Um, and it's really creating something of a perfect storm. Um, so the challenges we see, you know, are, are many in our clinics as we see mm -hmm. um, services slowly reducing and more and more people coming to us for assistance. Um, Paul, uh, let's talk a little bit about Doctors Without Borders. Um, obviously, with so much need everywhere for what you do, um, as well as the dangers that you face. I mean, a country like Myanmar, as you said, uh, even doctors aren't always safe uh, trying to do humanitarian <laughs> work over there. So. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you decide and where to put your resources and what sort of things that you uh, you cover. Obviously, uh, you have to prioritize certain things over the others. Yeah, absolutely. And we're an organization that's now 50 years old and we, we depend almost entirely on the financial support of just individuals around the world. So individual donors, people like you and me. Um, who dip into their pockets because they want to somehow make a change in the lives of people overseas. So we're not really funded by governments, almost entirely privately funded. Um, so we have to be very careful how we spend the money that we have. Um, and, and essentially, we, we try and access the most hard to reach places where, where essentially people are the most excluded from healthcare. Mm -hmm. That's often, of course, in conflict settings, in dangerous settings where you know, even the government itself has no access and um, inf health infrastructure hospitals have simply closed. So we're, we're in most of the big conflicts worldwide from, you know, Somalia to Sudan, Afghanistan, of course, obviously Ukraine. Um, and then outside of that, we try and deal with big, large scale medical emergencies. So, you know, outbreaks of infectious diseases. We were, we were, we, we put a huge investment into Ebola during the Ebola crisis in West Africa. Um, and then next to that, we, we also have a, a huge expertise in, in certain types of infectious disease. So we try and address people in need and, um, where, where there perhaps isn't the, the, the expertise or the specialization available. So things like HIV and resource poor settings, tuberculosis, multidrug resistant tuberculosis. Um, so we try and focus very much on um, where the needs are greatest. Uh, and where the gaps are biggest. And that's where, that's how we come together to try and prioritize the spend that we have. Um, and then outside of that, of course, there are many situations where people are excluded for political reasons. Um, and, uh, and, and we try um, also to, to uh, include that or to some extent in the work that, that we also do. But it, it's one of the hardest things is choosing what not to do. Yeah. There's so many needs around the world that, yeah, choosing what not to do or how to limit the scope of what we do in one country or in one project is always very, very difficult. Yeah, we can imagine it's like juggling so many things all yeah. at once and then trying to prioritize is, is, is such a difficult decision to make because uh -huh. there are so many you need. How do you prioritize one need and saying it's more important than Absolutely. the other? And it's a difficult task that you have to Because they're all just as important exactly. right now. And Paul, on, with, on that note, apart from helping the Rohingya refugees, what are some other of your activities currently? Can you share with us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, obviously what comes to everyone's mind probably is Ukraine. We were working in Ukraine for a long period of time before this latest conflict. It's, it's been insecure, of course, since 2014. And um, we were running a very, very large scale uh, um, TB program. Uh, they're dealing with um, you know, infectious disease. 
so we, we quickly adapted our programs to, um, to the war context um, there we've been uh, working with networks of doctors to try and improve trauma care and um, trying to provide essential supplies across U Ukraine, keep those lifelines open. Um, working as, as well with a lot of local organizations, local communities, trying to provide doctors, nurses, midwives, etc. outside of the conflict, you know, the immediate conflict because it's very insecure and very volatile. Um, on the one hand, providing referral so we can get people who've been injured out and provide them with treatment and care. And then try and address the range of other, you know, basic health needs that we, we, we all have that become completely disrupted um, when health systems are, are put under pressure like this or collapsed, people have to flee and leave. Um, and then a huge part of our work in that setting is dealing with the mental health consequences. You know, really traumatized people, men, women, particularly children, have seen things they should never see, trying to deal um, with mental health first aid, help them cope with those circumstances. Um, Afghanistan comes to mind also, of course, um, uh, again, we, we've been in Afghanistan for decades um, and, and, you know, currently we, did, despite the change uh, that happened over a year ago now, um, we've managed to maintain a full program across many different parts of Afghanistan. Um, we didn't leave, we stayed there and we continue to manage a, a full package from, from hospitals providing emergency care, um, basic inpatient services, pediatric services, so child health services dealing with uh, uh, maternal health as well um, so everything dealing with um, uh, reproductive health and safe deliveries and complicated emergency deliveries um, and even tuberculosis in, in places like Kandahar um, so yeah two, two big uh, more um, emergency style um, countries that come to mind where we have very very large footprints um, yeah those are a couple of examples I would share with you right now that are, are really occupying our time as well Right, uh, Paul, so um, before I ask you my next question, uh, the, if, uh, if you guys are wondering how you can help, uh, you can obviously donate, uh, like Paul said earlier, we can, it can, you can donate some money out of your own yep. pocket. The easiest way is just to go to the website, doctorswithoutborders.org or msf.org, and you can make a donation there. I've got it on my tab right here. It's real simple. You can make one-time donations, or you can make monthly donations, and you can just put in your payment information right there, and you can do your part. Um, however, um, in addition to that, though, Paul, apart from making a monetary donation, what can we and others out there do in their respective countries in order to help the cause? Yeah, I mean, the first thing I'd say is we, we also have a, a Southeast Asia operation and set up. Um, we have a Southeast Asia website where, you know, you can read about these things um, in Bahasa. Okay. Oh, um, wow. We encourage people to do that. Um, so, so we've really tried to you know, tailor our communication so yeah. people have more access so that they can understand what's going on. And, and that website's Doctors Without Borders dash APAC, A P A C okay. um, um, dot MSF dot org. Um, but outside of that, of course, uh, I mean, it, that we, we, we really need people. Um, so, you know, we actively recruit um, across the region, including in Indonesia. We have many Indonesians who work for us around the world, not just doctors, nurses, pediatricians, etc., but also people that come from many other backgrounds, finance backgrounds, backgrounds of supply, logistics. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you can, you can join us if, uh, if that's something you'd really like to, to, to think about. And again, you can find all the information on that same website, um, doctorswithoutborders-apac.msf.org. Mm -hmm. uh, and then take an interest, that's the thing. You know, often we have so many problems in our own countries and you know, it, Indonesia has so many emergencies a year to deal with and it's incredibly resilient at doing so. Um, but yeah, take an interest in what's happening outside <coughs> of our own countries. We, we all have to somehow lift ourselves a bit above COVID and the, yeah. the challenges we've all been facing and take an interest. Is there more we can do as individuals? Is there more our country should be doing to support some of these crises? You know, what more could Indonesia be doing perhaps to support the, the situation of the Rohingya? Um, I think it's, it's only gonna be resolved if all of the regional governments you know, come together um, across the ASEAN platform and do their best to try and address this political deadlock. Something has to change. Um, if, if that interests you, you know, think about that a bit more. Who could you talk to? Um, what do you think is important um, to change in this world? 
couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah. I agree with you completely, Paul. I mean, we're lucky enough to be able to report the news every day here and stay in touch. However, uh, for those of you out there, please do keep yourselves informed as to what's happening out there in the world. And perhaps there is something you can do to make it a better place. Paul, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Paul. We do appreciate you joining us this morning, and we hope to be able to talk to you again real soon. All the very best. Thank you, Paul. Have a great week. Karina and Paul, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.